say faith can move mountains. Well, in the case of the ancient Egyptians, it was their faith that made them move one mountain to build another. To do that, they invented not tools, but clever techniques and methods. I flew to Egypt, looking for remnants of their ancient past, to uncover something new about the ancient legacy. Following the legendary Nile was like stepping back in time, entering an ancient maze of mystery that has led us to the tangible examples of the ancients' knowledge and insights. The earliest Egyptians lived in a world without science, in a world full of mysteries with few explanations. Their legacy began 7,000 years ago, when they sought to harness the Nile. Every year the river flooded following the snow melt in the Ethiopian mountains 1,200 miles away. For the most part, the flood was a blessing because during drought time there was starvation. But the flood brought ample crops and life. Mind you, 97% of Egypt today is desert and the Nile was and is the main source of water. Thinking about their environment, the ancient Egyptians began to develop methods utilizing nature to their advantage. Mimicking the natural basins that retained water when the river receded, they built canals to direct the natural flow even to distant fields, where the Nile left behind nutrient-rich soil once the water evaporated. The Egyptians invented the world's first irrigation system, and the Nile became the key to their success. With a lot of time on their hands to think and wonder, the ancient Egyptians detected natural rules and cycles. The predominant force in their lives was the river. In a time before the era of hieroglyphs, we know that the ancients tried to predict its flood levels by carving markers into the rocks. Given their total dependence on the Nile, the Egyptians needed a way to forecast its behavior. Eventually, they built this pit designed to trap the rising water. They developed a Nilometer, a simple yet effective method. It could take various forms, but here on Elephantine Island at Aswan, it was a row of steps with a height in cubits carved into the wall. From the height the river reached, they knew what the year ahead had in store. A height of 18 cubits meant famine, 24 meant abundance, and 27 foretold disaster. The nilometer was a sign of life. Following the cycles of nature, they formally divided their year into three seasons. First came the flooding season, then the outflowing season of sowing and harvest. And finally, the inevitable drought that lasted until the life cycle of the Nile repeated itself. The ancients divided each season into four months, with the moon defining each month as a cycle of 29 to 30 days. From their Sumerian neighbors, the ancient Egyptians had already adopted a 360-day calendar. But the moon as a marker turned out not to be precise enough at least not when it came to predicting the flood. Eventually, they looked for another solution, one that would have far-reaching consequences. Step by step, they tried to find ways to order their world. And while discovering the rules and cycles of the night sky, the Egyptians noticed a particular star, Sirius, or Septet as they called it, rose once a year in mid-July around the beginning of the flood season. From then onward, this night marked the ancient's new year, an annual cycle of 365 days, just like our year today. Their desire to divide the day and calibrate time motivated the Egyptians to create markers of their own. I went to see this 3,500-year-old marker in Cairo, though across Egypt, obelisks like these were already in use 2,000 years earlier. 
Like giant sundials, the ancients could tell from their shadow what time it was. But how do you know what time it is when no obelisk is nearby? By around 1500 BC, the Egyptians had invented a portable sundial. The principle was simple. They pointed an L-shaped scale bar toward the sun to create a shadow. For accuracy, a plumb bob helped keep the instrument level. If held horizontally and pointed directly at the sun, the shadow matched the width of the scale bar. And where the shadow falls tells you what time it is. You have, in other words, a clock. For the first time in history, the ancient Egyptians formally divided the day, even though not into hours, but into 24 parts, just like we do today. As they gained more insights into nature's rules and cycles, there remained one mystery to unravel. The sun died in the evening to be reborn the following day. The Nile flooded each year, its waters bringing life, but as the waters receded, they followed death. From this natural cycle, the ancients must have concluded there was more to life than met the eye. There were two sides to the coin. On this side, life. On the other, the afterlife. But there was a catch. Just as you needed a body for this life, so you needed a body for the afterlife, ideally your own and intact. And that would have a ripple effect. In the early days, the Egyptians buried their dead inside the earth, wrapped in linen beneath the shifting desert sand. But sandstorms would regularly devastate their grave sites and scatter the remains of the ancestors across the desert floor, destroying the bodies they so desperately needed, because without an intact body, they believed there was no afterlife. So they began to find other methods and dug deeper into the desert rock, creating safer resting places that is, for those who could afford them. Tomb construction followed a basic design. They dug a shaft with one or more chambers at the bottom. Once the deceased was placed inside, the shaft was sealed with sand or a heavy rock, and the entrance covered with mud bricks. This is one of the oldest mud brick tombs remaining. And while this is a large one, they took on individual sizes and shapes. Whether square or beehive, the covers expressed the Egyptians' idea of the primeval earth mound from which all life had once emerged, and from which the dead were resurrected. As longevity became an issue, they replaced mud brick. For regal burials, the ancients now used stones, still shaped like mud bricks, but they were more durable. With stone, the Egyptians built among the oldest superstructures in human history. These are mastabas, flat rectangular tombs, an Arabic term for stone bench. Mastabas became a mark of status. I noticed here at Giza that with time the stone blocks became larger and the tombs more elaborate. This was a burial shaft. I could see that the ancient craftsmen were true masters. The high level of finish makes it hard to believe they're 5,000 years old. At the end of the shaft, a mastaba like this contained one or more burial chambers depending upon wealth. A rectangular superstructure above the burial shaft contained a corridor, a chapel, and another important feature, a serdub. In your position in society. I, uh, I met with the chief Egyptologist of the Giza Plateau, Mr. Mansour, to look inside a mastaba. Here is uh, the chapel or the corridor which leads to the chapel of the tomb. The chapel? Yes, but. You could see how important this tomb was by the level of finish and architectural detail. You know, this, uh, before the chapel of the tomb, you can see a corridor. And this corridor, if you look to the ceiling, you will see that they built it in a vaulted ceiling. Massive stone blocks form the walls and a saddle roof. Cleverly applying the right triangle, the ancient engineers calculated the arch, and then chipped away the stone to create the vaulted ceiling. It was one of the earliest uses of geometry. 
this corridor, they painted and they bought the wall paintings with the daily life uh, scenes. Mr. Mansour pointed out that the ancients took gifts and material belongings to their grave, but that wall paintings replaced the world they lived in. These images were as good as the real thing, depicting cherished activities like winemaking and details of their daily lives as farmers. Each picture a magical, eternal offering expressed in art. Now what about this hole in the wall? What's happening here? If you look here to this niche, small niche, it should contain a statue of... The Serdab was empty. But traditionally, the statue that resided here offered the sole refuge in case the body was stolen. Now where is this afterlife? Here. The afterlife is here. This is the chapel, the most holy place inside the tomb. Can we have a look in? Yes, please. Now, what would happen in the chapel? This is the most sacred place in the, in, inside this tomb, or in each, in any other tombs, which is, comprises the fourth door. The, the fourth, fourth door. door. All the chapel was built for this fourth door. Why is it called a false door? Well, a false door because I think the ancient Egyptians were loved the images, and this is the image of a real door. Following the ancients' love of images, Mr. Mansur explained, the false door mimicked a real door through which the deceased could return to his life to visit with family and friends and receive their offerings. In an adjoining tomb, I found a powerful presence, the soul's doorway and its resident statue. Along with the soul, the Egyptians believed a person was comprised of the body, the personality, the immortality and the name. Without an intact body, or at least a statue for the soul to inhabit, a person didn't have a shadow and therefore didn't exist. Their belief, however, was not the only motivator. Ego and politics were powerful forces too. It appears the time was ripe for someone to think outside the box. Mastabas were built to house the bodies of the dead for all time, and with the passing of the years they became larger and more ornate. Then, someone had a new idea. Modern Cairo today is home to 30% of Egypt's entire population. Like in ancient times, life still revolves around the Nile. and farming still remains a central part of it. The ancients used basic tools, yet they developed creative and intelligent methods, like the world's first irrigation system, to produce enough food to sustain an entire nation. But the Egyptians capitalized on yet another gift from the Nile, one that has left its permanent mark in world history, papyrus. The Egyptians invented one of the first portable recording mediums in the ancient world. To make a sheet of papyrus, they cut the inner pith of the stalk into strips. Then they'd soak them and arrange the pulp strips at right angles. Pounding began the fibre fusing process. Heavy weights further fused the plant cells after forcing the air out, reducing the thickness by about 75%. Air drying compressed the fibers by another 5%. Much of what we know about Egyptian tomb construction comes from papyrus records. But to appreciate these marvels, there's nothing like seeing the real thing. So I went to Saqqara, where it all began. Around 2600 BC, Imhotep, physician and architect of the pharaoh Zosa, came up with a tomb that was fit for a king. He had cared for the pharaoh's body in this life. Now he built him a home for the afterlife. Imhotep was considered a genius because he took Mastaba design to the next level, literally, sparking a whole new era. Imhotep started with a mastaba, which he expanded on two sides and built from the ground up, a four-step pyramid around it. While he was at it, he superimposed another, even bigger construction over the first, 
until he had created a tomb with six steps, reaching over 200 feet into the sky. The subterranean chambers he connected by a three and a half mile long maze of shafts and tunnels. Really unbelievable if you think about it. We have no record of what went on in Imhotep's head, but his innovative design really speaks for itself. Had he not created an image of the sun's rays? Or was it a staircase leading Zosa's soul heavenward towards his afterlife? Imhotep's step pyramid stunned the ancient world, and Zosa's tomb became Egypt's first pyramid. Trial and error, success and failure, whatever learning curves Imhotep's successes underwent, we don't know. Fact is, he sparked a whole new trend. How many attempts failed, we'll never know. Half a century later, either King Huni or King Sneferu took pyramid design to new heights. Experts don't know which one was responsible. To build higher, they experimented with the square base at Maidum. But the sky was the limit, and after relocating the gravesite to Dakhshur, Sneferu started a new, even more ambitious project. At first, it seemed to work. Except one third into the construction, Sneferu's ambition was curbed by the slope. One theory is that the tremendous static weight may have caused cracks on the interior walls. So they lowered the angle, earning his project the name Bent Pyramid. Experts believe it was because of this imperfection that Sneferu ordered a new pyramid. Talk about ambition and determination. For the Red Pyramid, they copied the square base and the new angle of the Bent Pyramid for overall better proportions. It may look like trial and error, but over time they learned to carefully calculate their constructions. The Rhine Papyrus dates from 1650 BC. While it's a copy from an earlier document, it may still be older because the era of pyramid construction had ended around 150 years earlier. It's a 15 foot long scroll. This part shows that the ancients came up with a formula to calculate the perfect proportions of a pyramid and that they had a basic understanding of the principles underlying the Pythagorean theorem a thousand years before Pythagoras was even born. What Sneferu had created was the first true pyramid. Four equal triangles on a square base. Now I wanted to see how they had solved the weight issues of the interior. A corridor leads into two antechambers and one burial chamber. They're located in the center, about 90 feet below the entrance. Given the size and weight of these blocks, the precision with which the Egyptians set them is really impressive. So this was how they distributed the massive weight. They built what architects call a corbelled ceiling. This one is over 40 feet high. Each tier projects out just a few inches from the one below until they meet at the top. Wow! Then, the corridor ascends for a few yards, leading into the burial chamber. Here, in the middle of the pyramid, you've got millions of pounds of rock all around you. It's like you're buried alive. The robbers have long since cleaned this place out, but the air in here smells like it hasn't changed in thousands of years. No fresh air gets in through this narrow passage, although the ceiling is 50 feet high. Stuffy doesn't come close. It's well over 90 degrees and the bats in here lace the air with a strong smell of ammonia. Phew. I can't tell you how good it feels to be out in the open air again. Today this is called the Red Pyramid, but originally it was white, covered in a glistening limestone casing to a height of 340 feet. But the sky was the limit. Soon the father would be outdone by the sun.
You may know the expressions, if you can dream it, you can do it, and that only the sky is the limit. When I visited the ancient sites of Egypt, I saw just how true these aphorisms were a long, long time ago. The ancient Egyptians created some of the most enduring structures in human history. Especially once they mastered the six major construction aspects that are consistent for all 80 or so pyramids they built. The first principle is the square base. To get a perfect square, they marked the four corners of the pyramid, something they probably did with strings. Precision is important, because if the sides aren't exactly even, you'll run into problems higher up. In a second phase, they built a rough, stepped core, like here at Giza outside Cairo, where it's possible to see the various layers. Much of what remains today is this core. This one is the biggest pyramid of them all. It is the tomb of Pharaoh Cheops, who ruled Egypt in the middle of the 25th century BC. Rising almost 500 feet above the desert floor, this was the tallest building in the world for nearly 5,000 years. Nobody knows exactly what their techniques were, because over time the traces of their construction methods have been erased, eternally sparking new theories. The third feature is the location and orientation of the pyramid. Since King Sneferu, all pyramids now faced east-west, equating the life and death of the king to the rising and setting sun. Orienting the pyramid in the right direction seems to have been no problem for the ancients, because the mean error on most pyramids is less than one degree. Selecting the location also included the aspect of sufficient construction material. For the foundation and the inner core, they used as many limestone blocks as possible from the immediate site. Experts have done the math. A pyramid like this required nearly two and a half million stone blocks, a virtual mountain. Here in the pyramid quarry, you can still see where they cut the core blocks out of the bedrock. Even today, quarrying is hard work and takes a lot of muscle, both human and mechanical. The comparison between our modern equipment and their techniques makes their accomplishments appear even more amazing. At an ancient quarry in Aswan, in the south of Egypt, I came to appreciate their determination. This is a block of dolerite, and believe it or not, it was all the Egyptians needed to quarry huge blocks of granite. They'd use it much like a sledgehammer, pounding away till they had holes like these, and eventually they'd have a trench. The work must have been extremely tedious, but it was very effective. It's just a question of uh, doing the work and other people hauling the blocks away to the pyramid site. I met with Dennis Stocks, an expert and author of a book on stone working technology in ancient Egypt. It's a question of a grid pattern to isolate blocks ready to extract them to put into the pyramid. He explained how they moved these blocks to build the pyramid core. Given the different sizes, they probably used various methods. In some cases, they probably dragged the blocks, while in others, they used sleds and wooden rollers. With simple wood levers, they most likely set the larger blocks in place. At the top, the rocks are much smaller and could probably be set by hand. In the fourth phase of construction, they filled in smaller stones to shape the actual pyramid. The trick was not so much the perfect shape of each block, but the overall height of each course, which had to be absolutely even and level. As you can see, the pyramids are built out of stones of all different shapes and sizes. Some as large as a truck, others the size of a fridge, all fitted exactly together. But as if that wasn't hard enough, the builders had to maintain a constant angle from one course of stones to the next. Only that way could they give the facade the smoothness of a piece of glass and maintain the angles with a razor-sharp precision.
The fifth aspect of pyramid construction was the right angle, the slope, and its proportion to the square base. This was crucial in terms of durability. Finally, there were the white, smoothly finished limestone casing blocks. In most cases, they've been stripped away as the pyramids themselves became quarries. The cap on Cheops' son, Khafre's tomb, is a remnant of that. I knew that Dennis had done some research on the casing blocks. I met him at the Pharaonic village in Giza, where he'd set up a workshop to demonstrate ancient stoneworking techniques. When I arrived, Dennis was just setting up a limestone block. Very good, thank you. The tools he prepared were surprisingly simple. I was curious to see how they'd used them. Jack, come and have a look at this over here. What have we got here, Dennis? Well, this block of stone is similar to the type that they would use in the Great Pyramid, particularly for the casing block. How did they get the block smooth enough to serve as a casing? Well, to start to get it smooth, we would use a tool like this. This is a copper chisel, and the copper came from copper ore, which comes from the Sinai. Dennis told me that the ancients used three naturally occurring materials, copper ore, flint, and sand. From copper ore, they made chisels, adzes, borers, and drills. I always thought that copper was a very soft metal. How can you cut stone with copper? Ah, now, the secret with this is, is that it is hammered cold, not like uh, a modern steel chisel, and that hardens the edge if it's left to cool naturally. Okay, and then you can cut the stone? Yes, it's quite simple to do. You just get the chisel, put the edge on, and then gradually chip away by altering the angle of the chisel in order to get a clean cut along the stone. And that gives you a cut that's smooth enough to build the casing stone? Yes, eventually you would get it quite flat. But then there's another technique they could use, which is using a flint scraper. It has a sharp edge along there and can be used like this. Just angle it at the stone and gradually scrape away the high points like so. Now, Jack, why don't you have a go yourself with this? Um, oh, it's quite soft, isn't it? Yeah. So you can really just. Uh, yeah. And so with this yeah. thing, you just you just even yes, away all and, the and rough you, edges. you can gradually get that um, even down until you get a smooth surface. Polishing is one thing, but how do you know when you've got the finished product? How do you know that your surface is absolutely flat? Well, let me show you. First of all, they needed an accurate tool to test the surface as to see whether it was flat or not. Mm -hmm. Really, what it amounts to, if you just hold that for me, Jack, um, and stretch that out tight on the surface like that. Mm -hmm. Now, what this is are three rods that are all the same length. Now, this is extremely important. So that when the string is taut, you can check underneath the string with the rod to see if there are any high spots, like so. So if we touch the string, we know that there's a bump right there. Yeah, if we... the string lifts up like that, you know that there's a bump. Unbelievable. This technique was really clever, but if you think of the millions of stone blocks that required such detail, I was skeptical as to how effective it had been in the field. So I challenged Dennis to a little experiment. If we walk along this way, you'll see that blocks are in a line and they seem pretty level with each other. How did they keep them so level? Well, they had to use a means of testing them. So we'll test them and see how good they are. Let's use the old levelling tool again. Our old friend. The rods and string. Yes. You place your end on that block there, and I'll try this block here. And we'll try your block first with the testing rod. Oh, so that's brilliant, good, isn't it? Pretty perfect. That's yeah. good there, but this is the bit here. How's this level here? Oh, yes. You've got to have nothing but admiration for them. So they've got it exactly right. Absolutely right. So the blocks are level. But that wasn't enough. For the pyramid to remain stable, the blocks had to be horizontal. Dennis had brought another ancient tool. Now, we can use this A-frame to check whether the block is truly horizontal. Horizontal like a, like a surface of water? Yeah, in fact, 
we can use the surface of water to check that the frame is accurate. And we do this by marking a line behind the hanging plumb line. So if your measurement is flat, then this will always hang absolutely vertically. And then you know the rock is horizontal. Yes. So how, how is that now? It's bang on. It's absolutely right in the middle. It's very good. Very good. But that's one thing. I mean, if you know the block is horizontal, that's fine. But surely you also need to know whether the sides are vertical. Yeah, that's right, Jack. But they had another tool for this purpose. And there was only one place to test it. Now, this is one of the casing blocks that once covered the entire pyramid. That's right, Jack. Um, because this casing block has to fit to its neighbour, the vertical face has to be truly vertical. And they could test it with this particular tool, which is called an F-frame. And by the way, this is the only place on the plateau that we can test whether a casing block surface is truly vertical. This is a simple tool. As so long as this distance is equal to this distance and the plumb line is touching both the ends, then we can say that the surface is truly vertical. So how's it doing, Jack? It's doing pretty well. It's then we can show that the surface is vertical. Pretty simple, huh? Well, they've got it right again, Jack. But who were they? The ancient Egyptians were foremost farmers. Yet the pharaohs were able to assemble a massive workforce. Until now, it was believed that the source of that manpower was slavery. But new evidence suggests otherwise. The pyramids were not built on the backs of slaves, but rather on devotion and commitment. Today, Aswan, the ancient capital of Nubia in southern Egypt, is a destination for all who are eager to explore the Nile. In ancient times, Aswan was first and foremost the source of special stones for a special purpose inside the tombs. Even today, the stone found here is prized. 5,000 years ago, granite blocks like these were quarried and shipped down the river. While the quarry gangs toiled away, moving one mountain to build another, other crews worked here at the Pyramid Harbour. It was called a harbour because it was, believe it or not, full of water, connected by canal to the Nile. It was a scene of heaving activity, like a modern container port, for it was here that all the fine stones arrived by boat. Here the stones were unloaded and then hauled up the hill to the pyramids. The ancients knew that the angle of the ramps was crucial. Between six and seven degrees was perfect to defy gravity. From the harbour, the stones were loaded onto sleds, which were then hauled up the hill, lubricated with powdered lime and water, reducing the friction by 90%. This is no hill. You want to haul a rock up. I wondered who the people were who dragged heavy stones up to the pyramids day after day during the 20 to 30 years of construction that it took to build these giants. So I went to the foot of the Giza Plateau, where a graveyard is being excavated. It is the resting place of those who worked on the pyramids nearby. The graves provide a glimpse of the workers' lifestyle and hint at the social and economic importance pyramid construction held for the entire nation. Dr. Hawass, what do the tombs tell us? This is the first time, actually, that we know about the life of the workmen who built the pyramids. Before that, we know a lot about nobles and officials and kings and uh, queens, but nothing about the common people who represent 80% of the nation in that time. And Dr. Zai Hawass, Secretary General of Antiquities, met with me to share the latest discoveries. 
How was it that the Egyptians managed to get so many people working on such a colossal enterprise? Was this a system of forced labor, of coercion? Or was it more a system of cooperation? You have to understand one important thing, that the pyramid was the national project of the whole nation. Hmm. The whole country, the one million and six hundred thousand, who actually was the number of population in Egypt in that time, dedicated their life to build that pyramid because it is for the king who is actually the god. Hmm. So it's certainly not an army of forced slaves. No. We believe that the number of the workmen was only 10,000 workmen. Maybe one third was actually a permanent workman who worked for the king permanently. And the rest will be workmen, young people, who came through the support of the households in the Delta and in Upper Egypt. Contrary to what has been assumed, evidence emerges that the basic workforce, the muscle power in the construction of the pyramids, were not slaves, but devoted farmers. Every family had to send their share. You know, like today, if you go to any village in Upper Egypt or Lower Egypt, they do like the time of building the pyramid. If you try to build your house, you'll find that every day, every family in the village will bring you food. Building the pyramid was the same like this. What about the Nile and the annual flooding that occurred? Did that affect the work on the pyramids? It does, but it helped in working the pyramid because when the flood completely covered Egypt, there is no work for anyone. What you've described here is really a small city. 10,000 people is a lot of people. How did they organize that? A crew consists of 2,000 workmen. Mm -hmm. And they divide the crew to two gangs. Each gang consists of 1,000 workmen. Each gang had a name, like uh, friends of Khufu, main cowardized drunk. Each group had an overseer. Then the whole 10,000 were organized by groups, by gangs, by small groups. Then this whole organization could be very easy. They had a big uh, area, like a canteen or for feeding all the workmen. Uh, you have all storage facilities to store all their equipment the tools, because each workman cannot own a tool. The tools were owned by the government. They have people who take care of their clothes. They have people who take care of their food. They have people who really prepare everything for them. Like a pyramid? Yeah. Why do you wonder all the time about building the pyramid? The administration of building the pyramid is more genius to anyone than really uh, building the pyramid itself. And this is why the pyramid built Egypt because building this pyramid made them to know about art, technology, and science. I came to realize how much of what the ancients knew reverberates across time while walking through modern Aswan. I happened to pass by a construction site where the techniques were strikingly similar to the ancient methods. Simple tools, muscle power and knowledge passed down for generations were all they needed to encase a slope. Strings are still used to keep the surface level. There, like a slice out of time, I saw what it may have looked like thousands of years ago in ancient Egypt. The Egyptian faith in an afterlife spurred not only science and technology, but commerce. Like modern Cairo, the workers' village required a huge amount of supplies on a daily basis. Many sought to fill those needs. And as their belief radiated out beyond the royal grave sites, it touched every aspect of Egyptian daily life. More and more people turn to supplying the demand while generating a demand of their own. Undertaking and all aspects associated with it became a major industry. Incense, balms and ointments that had been the king's prerogatives were now also desired by the masses. Salam. Salam. I need an ancient perfume. This is Ramses. This is stronger and fresh. Hmm. You want something more stronger? Or lace or... This one? This is lotus flower. 
strong. Oh, it's very strong. Oh, it's very strong flower. Okay. Believed to be the scent of the gods, perfumed oils were applied to the skin for both cosmetic and medicinal purposes, and also used in the mummification process. So you could say that perfume was yet another invention we owe to the Egyptians' belief in the afterlife. They also created one of the world's most enduring fascinations. In the Cairo Museum, I saw some of the stunning results of the ancient undertaker's art and science. Though they are shocking in their stark reality, the mummies provide an invaluable record of the beliefs, the science and the lives of the ancient Egyptians. Six feet tall, 90 years old, the father of a hundred children during a reign of 70 years, the legendary Ramses II surpassed all Egyptian rulers. The mummification process during Queen Nejimet's time included the tucking of natron, a naturally occurring salt, in packages under the skin and into the body's hollows. When she was found and transferred up the Nile to Cairo, the natron that had once dehydrated her body absorbed the moisture on the river, causing her dried skin to burst. King Sekinin Ra's mummy tells of a violent world which he left following a head wound sustained in battle. Amimhotep I, his grandson, is resting in a shroud adorned with flower garlands. Just like today, flowers were a token of love. The mummies tell us that the Egyptians set broken bones, performed amputations and suffered, like many of us, from arthritis. These silent messengers bear witness to a mastery of technology and an astonishing depth of knowledge. Nearby, I found another ancient marvel, a hollowed out granite block, the ancient's coffin or sarcophagus. The surface was astonishingly smooth. Cleverly, they cut the lid from the same block. An amazing piece of expert craftsmanship and precision. It really makes you wonder. Working granite requires a lot of mechanical force. Where we use pneumatic equipment, all the Egyptians needed was a simple yet nifty technique. The barren environment of the desert inspired the ancient Egyptians to create colourful images, be it for this life or the afterlife. In their world, flowers took on a special meaning. Records from 2200 BC show that it was in ancient Egypt where the first ornamental gardens were created, more than 1500 years before the fabled hanging gardens of Babylon. Solely a prerogative of royalty, some say the ancient gardens were an expression of the God King's might, so powerful he could grow flowers where nature did not. But the ancients saw more in them. They were an image of rebirth and regeneration, tokens of love and worship for the passage from this life to the afterlife. Placed with the mummies inside their coffins, flowers were believed to protect them for an eternity, and granite, so they believed, provided the ultimate insurance. On the Mohs scale of 1 to 10, granite is a 7, making it at least as hard as steel. Just how they were able to hollow out a piece of rock this hard was a question for ancient technology expert Dennis Stocks. You know, one of the most difficult things that the Egyptians had to do, a very mystifying process, is how did they drill the holes in solid rock? Anyway, this is the way that they did it. First of all, they had a copper tube which had a shaft of wood driven part way into it so that there's a space in the tube underneath. Then they could get the tube in position and the cutting agent is just common desert sand. So that's, you're just pouring sand in there so that the, the copper has a, has a sharp edge to cut. Yes. Now, we've got a long bow here with a rope on which has been given a double turn around the shaft. Now there's only one component to put in place. Can we put the uh, top capstone on? Now, this is just to put in position for the shaft to rotate, rotate in while the bottom rotates in the hole. 
So if you'd like to take hold of this, so this hold, this is what holds the yes, drill just in hold place, that yeah? and like don't that? put any pressure on. And while the two operators turn the drill, the sand is now steadily and slowly but surely cutting its way right through the stone. And the only limiting factor is our strength and the length of the copper tube. Right. So it's a very good technique, and of course it's very, very economical. Why? Because you're only drilling the circumference of the tube out, the core can be knocked out later, and you're left with a, a hole. Super technology, really is. With basic tools but masterful application, the ancient Egyptians created world wonders. And while their knowledge and experience grew, the craftsmanship of the pyramids went downhill. As industries expanded and diversified, social classes emerged that were no longer dependent on the royal family. Some historians also believe that wars, famines and a power shift to the south contributed to the decline. But it took another thousand years before the ancient Egyptians were dealt the final blow. A new faith arose, and while it also acknowledged the concept of a life after death, it argued that you didn't need a body to enjoy it. Christianity swept through Egypt followed by other religions erasing an over 3,000 year old tradition in only a few centuries, eclipsing a culture and a lifestyle that had been shaped by the pyramids. In their quest for an eternal life, they leave behind a legacy of basic geometry, rudimentary science and seminal technologies, preparing the ground for intellectual growth elsewhere. When we think of the great intellectually and scientifically advanced cultures of the ancient Western world, we tend to concentrate on Greece and Rome. But both cultures achieved their greatness thanks in part to what the ancient Egyptians knew. Their knowledge did not remain trapped in these desert sands but spilled out into the wider world, beyond the shores of the Nile. From where it eventually reached us, reminding us, in light of our own achievements in technology and science, that we stand in awe on the shoulders of giants known as the Egyptians. <laughs>